Hello everyone, this is David and today I have an amazing guest with me today. I have Mr. Paul Gilbert. Is it Gilbert or Gilbert? I'm really not that good sometimes with names. <laughs> yeah, I have Mr. Paul Gilbert with me here today. Um, he is an independent publisher. Of course, I think he can introduce himself much better than I can do, but he's an independent publisher whose main work relies on uh, defending Tsar, Tsar St. Nicholas against the slanders of uh, modern academia and whatnot. And um, I've, I've noticed, I found out about Mr. Gilbert, I think two years ago. Um, and some of the articles really interested me because there's this huge narrative about St. Nicholas, a lot of different myths about him that even I at the first glance just thought it, there's no way it can be true because it just seems like something is being pushed. And I have an icon uh, of the royal family over here. Uh, so it, I got from my parish, I think, more than a year ago. Um, so I personally, in general, really revere monarchs, but St. Nicholas is definitely one of the uh, really most significant Orthodox Christian saints who was a monarch, especially in the 20th century. So I want to kind of start with just by asking, uh, you know, well, before, before I get to the questions, Mr. Paul Gilbert, may you introduce yourself to your works? Uh, what do you publish, etc.? last 27 years of my life to uh, researching and writing about the uh, the Russian imperial family and the history of uh, uh, the czars, imperial Russia, etc. Uh, my main focus has always been the life and reign of uh, uh, Emperor Nicholas II. Uh, he has always intrigued me because I feel that history has done him wrong. Mm -hmm. Uh, he um, uh, has been uh, victimized during the Soviet years to the present day. And uh, as a result of that, uh, I uh, have now devoted my uh, entire uh, full time uh, to the uh, study of his life and reign to help clear his name. There are so many uh, myths and lies which uh, have survived to this day that need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is my personal mission. Mm -hmm. Yes, and just for the viewers out there, uh, you are indeed an Orthodox Christian, yes? No, I'm not. Mm. I'm on, I am on my journey to uh, entering the Orthodox Church. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is uh, it is because of uh, Saint Tsar Nicholas II mm -hmm. that I am embarking on this journey, mm -hmm. because I have always felt very drawn to the Orthodox faith. Mm -hmm. uh, when I am in Russia, I uh, I am in the Russian churches every single day in prayer, in mm -hmm. solitude, and reflection. And uh, within the next uh, year or two, I will be uh, I will be uh, accepted into the uh, Russian mm -hmm. Orthodox Church. Yes, uh, that's great to hear. So I want to start with the first question, then, and this is kind of a basic question: Who even is Saint Tsar Nicholas? In the sense that, what was his personal life like? What was his spiritual life like? What kind of a person was he? Uh, well. We all know the, that uh, Nicholas was a uh, devoted father and husband. He's one of the few uh, Russian czars who remained faithful to his wife through uh, his entire marriage. He was a uh, Orthodox Christian to the core. And uh, it was because of him that the Russian Orthodox Church flourished during his reign. He was responsible for the construction and restoration of uh, many, many churches, monasteries, uh, convents uh, during his reign. He developed a uh, icon um, 
uh, manufactory that ensured that Russian icons were uh, not uh, outmarketed by uh, foreign uh, forgeries and fakes. But uh, in my opinion, he was, yes, he was an autocrat, but he put Russia first. Mm -hmm. He um, was dedicated to his, his empire and to his people. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, he was a, um, a progressive czar. He, uh, he may have taken things a little slower than what the liberals or the socialists had uh, wanted him to take uh, the Russia's direction in. Mm -hmm. But uh, in all fairness, he was, he believed with all his heart and soul that he was uh, God anointed. Mm -hmm. And he upheld that to his, uh, to the day of his uh, death and martyrdom. But uh, he is, uh, he is uh, not understood in this, um, uh, in our Western society, especially. I think the Russians have a better understanding of him, regardless of their political uh, agenda. But I do believe that uh, the problem is more in the West than it is in, in Russia. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, I think that's a good starting point, especially with the things he's, he has done for the faith, especially like for Orthodox Christians. It's not something we can really say, you know, we have to kind of take, especially another thing that reminded me of is, what he did in regards to the canonization of Saint Seraphim of Soro, which is one of the most important Russian saints. Yes. Um, and I've, I, this is what I've heard. I can't really completely verify, but I've heard from many Orthodox Christian friends that the, the nobles at that time, a lot of the kind of the elites, uh, they didn't even think Saint Seraphim could be canonized as a saint because of his educational or social status. I mean, that kind of reflected the the very mm, disconnected feelings some people had at that time which is what makes saint nicholas's piety even stronger because he was much more in in touch with the orthodox mindset i will say compared to a lot of r contemporary russians at that time um so i think a big mistake sometimes people make and i'm i myself am a you know i am a defender of monarchy i'm a defender of tradition but we also have to be realistic that pe that Russia at that time wasn't really good. And it's not because of the emperors, it's because of many different factors. Um, on the topic of Western misrepresentations, this is my second question, mm -hmm. is that you point out a lot of different myths. One of those is that people claim that St. Nicholas was supposedly this bad ruler and a lot of people seem to be thinking this way. Uh, this is like the kind of norm and axiom that people just accept on the face of it. Was he really bad at ruling or is this just a misrepresentation? And he actually was very good or at least good at what he was doing. I believe, I, as I previously said, I believe that he was a progressive czar and uh, he was surrounded by... Uh, incompetent ministers uh, during his reign, which was why they were constantly being reshuffled. But at the same time, uh, we, we cannot um, um, forget that the revolutionaries were hellbound and bent on destroying the monarchy. Mm -hmm. And in the process, um, uh, the reign of Nicholas II. He uh, was responsible for many um, changes within uh, for the lives of the, of the Russian people. Uh, he passed many, many new, uh, or he issued many new decrees on improving the standards of living for the Russian people. But the, the myths that he was a bad czar all percolated from the revolutionaries. Mm -hmm. The, um, they didn't like the policies that he was uh, indoor, uh, bringing into effect. And that is the primary reason why his uh, prime minister, uh, Pyotr uh, Stolipin, was assassinated in Kiev in 1911. 
uh, had Stuli been lived, uh, one can only speculate as to the uh, what what type of or what kind of Russia would have emerged. Uh, would the Russian uh, people have been much more supportive of their czar and turned their back on the revolutionaries as they should have? Mm -hmm. Yes, and one thing you you noted that that was important to understand is that a lot of this co comes from revolutionaries, and so yes. this narr this is a narrative. It's based on revolutionary presuppositions, and so. If, for example, if you come from kind of this, you know, Western social democratic kind of viewpoint, I mean, the same, those same revolutionaries will consider your ideal system to be bad as well. So mm -hmm. to kind of judge people according to what they claim is, is, it's kind of just listening to the propaganda coming from the enemy. It's, it's kind of inherently not fair. Um, and I, and I remember reading that, uh, from, uh your your article um i forgot the a century of treason treason cowardice and lies uh that a lot of this information we have about about saint nicholas uh kind of resurfaced 25 years ago with the kind of uh documents being opened in russia and you know this is why russians have a better view compared to the westerners because russians have more up-to-date documents on this issue yes there, it's it's important to go back a little bit too, uh, back to the Soviet years, because uh, during the Soviet years, particularly during the Stalinist years, Stalin ordered the uh, the Romanov archives to be sealed. Yeah. The they were not even accessible to Soviet historians, but on uh, only for propaganda purposes. Stalin uh, and earlier the Bolsheviks simply did not want the Russian people to uh, to see the Tsar and his family as a normal, everyday loving family. And Lenin in particular uh, wanted uh, very much for his name to be kept out of the, the regicide because he was uncertain how the West would react to the fact that um, children had been slaughtered. And um, during the, again, going back to Stalin, he had the, the archive sealed. And only after 1991 were the archives opened and the Russian, the new generation of post-Soviet historians flooded the archives. And they started um, sifting through documents that most Western scholars, historians and biographers, have never even set eyes on. So as a result, in the, in the ensuing years, they started producing articles and books and documentaries, which presented Nicholas II, his life and reign in a very, very different uh, light and a much more positive light. He was not the backward uh, monarch, which uh, is the, the most popular myth uh, which exists to this day. But the, the, the opening of the archives has uh, uh, the research, like I said, from the new generation of Soviet historian has really um, uh, helped to uh, diminish and um, challenge the popular negative uh, assessment of Nicholas in the West. Yes, indeed. And this will also explain why the Russian Orthodox Church canonized them, because their research was dependent on those documents. That's how they came, came to the information. It reminds me of uh, my patron saint, who is Saint David Komnenos. He was the last Roman emperor in the city of Trebizond. Um, it's kind of the same. It's kind of similar because he was kind of considered as a saint after his death. But we came to that information I think in 2010, uh, it's it's similar in the sense that, you know, we came to that information over time. It wasn't something mm -hmm. instantaneous. Mm -hmm. And I think the approach of the Russian Orthodox Church taking that is just actually affirms what you're saying, that we just didn't have information on St. Nicholas because uh, 
you know, this is my theory, and I think this is implied, is that the communists just thought, you know, if they saw what kind of a man he was, no one will think they were, you know, good people. Everyone will say, you know, what did you just do? You know, you people are messed up, and um, I don't think we should allow you to have your nation. <laughs> it would make people will think that way. And Well, yeah. I think that had Nicholas been truly a bad ruler, uh, his reign would not have lasted almost 23 years. Yes. And I'd like to add, too, that uh, since the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, it is the Russian Orthodox Church in Russia who have been, um, uh, they have a spearheaded campaign to uh, raise the truth about Nicholas and present him to the Russian, to today's uh, Russian people in a whole in light, in a positive light, they uh, there are so many websites now and orthodox sites which tell the truth about uh, Nicholas. And this is all the result of the, the efforts of the Russian Orthodox Church, and I commend them for it. Yeah, uh, yeah, I definitely agree. And I think this is one of the when I was becoming Orthodox, this was one of the pleasant things that I saw because I was, even before I was becoming Orthodox, I had the kind of a monarchistic view. And it was pretty pleasant to see because, you know, even today, it seems like they don't, they have this healthy view of monarchy, which is definitely something I appreciate. Um, and I think, especially I've, I remember reading some articles, uh, scholarly works, on the Russian economy at that time, where, you know, this idea of a famine or, or stuff like that going happening during his time was greatly exaggerated. And as a matter mm -hmm. of fact, if, you know, whether those crises even happened is in question, but if it did happen, it was limited to a certain area. And they compared uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg, uh, the economic growth in those cities compared with other European cities, and they were above average. Um, in generally speaking. So I think that kind of casts a ma massive dot as well to the narrative that is ran in the vest on the econo economic issue, uh, mm -hmm. for sure. And for, for another question I had is, uh, it, as I've noted before, the article, A Century of Treason, Cowardice and Lies, uh, which was published, uh, the, the publication is from Sovereign, right? That's what it's called. Uh, you debunk four common myths about St. Nicholas. Uh, these four myths are him supposedly not being prepared for the throne, then Russia being poor and backwards under him, the Tsar being a drunkard, and the people mm -hmm. meeting his death with indifference. You know, these popular myths at, at that time. Um, none of these are true, but, you know, we still see these myths going around uh, and other myths, you know, that are just debunked and not true. Uh, why do you think that is the case? Why do you think that's going on, especially in the West? There's a number of reasons. Um, I think one of the main being with uh, today's uh, historians and writers is uh, simple academic laziness. Mm -hmm. As uh, mm -hmm. you had pointed out in, uh, in one of your messages, that is, is definitely part of it. There is also the fact that um, people get ideas stuck in their head and they just simply refuse to accept anything that's new and fresh in terms of research. And they cling to these old myths and lies because it's more comfortable than sitting down and doing some homework and educating oneself. And it, it's, it's unfortunate that I mean, you pointed out four myths, but there are so many. There are so many. And um, they continue. These, these same myths continue to be uh, the subject of, of many, many questions. And there are people who still don't, regardless of the, the, the current research that's been done by, by Russian uh, academics. They still, they refuted it. They said, oh, it can't be. And what they're doing, they're the, all of this, all of these myths and lies are based on um, uh, parlor room gossip and 
that goes back to uh, the early 20th century in St. Petersburg. And even the, the Tsar and, and, and uh, uh, his wife, Alexandra Fedorovna, they were so disgusted by the debauchery which existed in the, in the capital in the early 20th century. And that's one of the reasons why they preferred the, the comfort of their own home and their family. And then um, there's, there's the, the parlor room gossip. There was gossip within the imperial family themselves, uh, most notably from the, um, the palace of uh, Grand Duchess Maria Pavlovna, uh, who was the widow of Grand Duke Vladimir Alexandrovich. Uh, she held her own court at her palace uh, on the uh, on the Neva River, and it was a watering hole for uh, liberal thinkers. And uh, she spread much malicious gossip, in particular about the Empress, which was unfortunate. And uh, she was a horrible woman. And then, after following the the revolution, when the there was uh, the white immigration, uh, members of the imperial court and uh, members of the nobility who uh, were lucky to have escaped from Bolshevik Russia, they uh, wrote their memoirs. And again, when you read some of these memoirs, they are writing from memory, and they cite some of these myths, but none of these people were present at the events that they are talking about. So it's nothing but hearsay and gossip. And then of course, throughout the entire, uh, from 1918 to the present day, the, uh, the myths and the lies continue to persist. And the Bolsheviks and later the Soviets were, were perfectly content to let these myths lie because they did not want um, their history to be interpreted correctly. So that, those are just some of the reasons. Yeah, and that kind of gets in touch with the with the other question that I had is, um, this is, it's kind of a question mixed with, with a sentiment of mine. And I think it's not only my sentiment, it's the sentiment of I believe a lot of Orthodox Christians um, who have, you know, who, uh, venerate the Tsar. It seems to be the case that there is, you know, as you said, academic laziness, but it seems to be, is it is it possible that the source of this is also a coming from a political agenda, which purpose is, you know, as you noted, more liberalism, as opposed to monarchism, is this some form of also kind of like an ideological warfare in some sense where they, you know, that does that motivation you think exists in academia today? Because I believe I've read a lot of academic theological works that motivation sometimes does exist in theological books. So I've noticed that I, I, I wonder if that exists in academia today as well in regards to St. Nicholas. Well, there's, there's certainly an element of, of truth to that. Uh, I think the only political agenda that would, would challenge that, uh, challenge the myth today, is that of the Communist Party. Uh, they hate the monarchy. They hated Nicholas. They, it, it would have been regardless of who was ruling, they would, they would uh, dispute it. But uh, there's also the, the growing liberal agenda in the West today, um, uh, much of that um, is anti-monarchist. They, uh, they, as well, prefer to look upon Nicholas as a uh, bloody Nicholas. He was a tyrant and a dictator, uh, etc. But uh, yeah, there's definitely an element of, uh, of a political agenda there as well. Yes, um, and I think... Um one of the one of the big mistakes i see this because in in normal circles it's kind of unavoidable but i think for as orthodox christians it's kind of a mission of ours to understand that the, sometimes the source of information where it's coming from and their presuppositions matter i i it's it's the same kind of thinking that i see from liberal academia in regards, regards to scripture for example how they view scripture and uh and from the get-go, before they even analyze the evidence and the facts, uh, a lot of them approach 
affirming their own worldview. So, for example, if they're approaching historical documents about the Tsar, it's from the perspective of, well, the Tsar is bad. So I'm going to be looking for that. And I'm kind of going to be ignoring the, you know, the good aspects as, ah, uh, you know, whatever. That's just like what people <laughs> call them as. So that kind of presupposition, I think, definitely also really um, damages historical perspective. Yeah. Because yeah. as I said, um, you know, I'm not an academic or anything like that. But as I said, I read theology, theological works, and I see this kind of attitude a lot in church history. Um, that's why I kind of just read Orthodox academics uh, more so. But having uh, said that about St. Nicholas, uh, in, in these topics, alongside St. Nicholas and his family, a figure that a lot of people seem to have a lot of ideas on, is Rasputin. I've heard so many opinions about Rasputin. I've heard people say he's a saint. I've seen people say he's a demon. I've seen people say he's a, you know, the rah rah, that horrible song. Not that I'm not going to repeat because it's a, it, the contents of that song is horrible. But it's blasphemous. Yeah, it's, it's, blasphemous. it's horrible. So, who, re, like, what is Rasputin? Like, is he good? Like, what is he about? Uh, what's the truth about him, at least, in context to St. Nicholas? Well, Rasputin is, remains a very controversial figure to this day. Um, there are different theories about him. Um, personally, I do not believe that he had uh, some sort of power uh, over the Zarevich and his illness. Uh, I've never, I can't accept that as truth. And I, that's not su suggesting that I don't believe in miracles because I do. But I think that Rasputin came at a time when the Empress in particular needed strength. And I think that his presence and his prayers offered that to her. There is a popular theory that uh, he greatly influenced the Tsar and that is absolute nonsense. Uh, Nicholas uh, put Rasputin in his place on more than one occasion and at one point uh, exiled him from the capital. But it was, I believe that, the, that Nicholas um, tolerated Rasputin because of his wife. By that time, the poor empress was in such a state of uh, poor health, both physically and mentally, because of the health of her son. And we have to remember, what, what kind of a toll must that have taken on, on, on her? Putting aside the fact that she was the Empress of Russia, she was still a mother first. And this woman who had tried time and time again to give her husband and uh, Russia an heir to the throne, she had four successive daughters, all of whom were greatly, greatly loved by their parents. And then finally, when the heir was born, only to discover that he had inherited the uh, hemophilia directly from his mother. So the guilt that must have consumed that poor woman for the rest of her life, and every time the Zarevich became ill, no one knew if that was going to be a uh, result in his death. So it, Rasputin brought calm to the Empress. And I think that that was his, his, the good thing about it. I do not believe in, in many of the police reports that were issued at the time. Uh, there are, uh, there's a theory that there was a double and he was the one that was involved with all the debauchery that was going on in the, the capital, etc. But do I think that Rasputin was a was a bad man? No. Did he help bring down the Russian Empire? Possibly. But it that theory in itself is based more on people who were living at the time, and were subjecting their opinions to the gossip that was spreading throughout the capital about uh, uh, Rasputin. 
And uh, there's today there's a popular movement movement to have him canonized. Uh, again, uh, it, it is all part of uh, the, the controversy which is which surrounds him. Uh, it will be very very interesting to see how uh, uh, history, uh, as we begin to learn more and more about him, and uh, how Russian Orthodox Christians perceive him. Uh, in the future. Yes, and I think the the Orthodox Church, uh, with the authority of the Holy Spirit, I think if he really is a saint, if he is really a saint, um, I'm not saying he is, I, I don't have opinions on things, I don't have much information on, you know, this is something that will be revealed, but I think it's, yeah, um, it's something that we just have to wait and see if that's the case, because as a, as we, he's one of the most kind of enigmatic personalities I've noticed mm -hmm. in history. Yeah. So many opinions about him. It's just even if you ignore the mainstream opinion, because, you know, anything that's mainstream about Russian history, from my experience, it's just trash. It's just not true. It's just false. But even if you ignore that, there's just so many different views. And I think another thing what i've learned from from listening to you is that you know i'm i'm seeing more reason why slander is such a horrible sin slander can cause so much misinformation and so much problems in an empire and this is just the kind of court slander and gossiping uh is just proof itself that a lot of russian society was genuinely dysfunctional um and it's kind of a sad state of affairs it also reminds me, speaking of Russian societies, I think you noted this in, in your articles as well, kind of the Moscow, I think this was in your presentation by a monastery, I forgot the name of the monastery, the 20 minute video of it, where Moscow represented the kind of Russian tradition and orthodoxy a little bit, whereas St. Petersburg represented Westernism, modernism, and this kind of, you know, mindset. Uh, can you go a bit into that, kind of how that developed and how that manifested in St. Nicholas's time and whether, you know, did that have any influence on his downfall or something related to that? Well, of course, uh, Moscow represented Holy Russia. Mm -hmm. And uh, be, Nicholas, being uh, a devout Orthodox Christian, was very drawn to Moscow. He, uh, he visited Moscow probably more times than any previous Russian monarch. And like his father, both loved Moscow because of it, uh, its holiness. And uh, there was one, uh, it was one year that Nicholas and Alexander traveled to Moscow to spend Pasha. And uh, he, Nicholas writes in his uh, letters to his mother about what a joy it was to be in, in holy Moscow and visiting the churches and attending the, uh, the, the liturgies and the morning matins, etc. And um, the two cities were so drastically, drastically different. Uh, Moscow embodied not just Holy Russia, but Old Russia, the old traditions, whereas St. Petersburg uh, represented uh, modernity, and of course it was Peter the Great's window to the, to the West. And it, it was, uh, it truly was uh, debauched in so many ways, drinking, gambling, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I can truly understand why Nicholas was drawn to Moscow. Um, it's interesting, even today, uh, many people don't uh, realize this, but some of Russia's most magnificent monuments to uh, St. Nicholas are in Moscow. Uh, you have to travel out a bit, but they're certainly worth seeing. And I think that 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 would make uh, Nicholas very happy to know that he has been memorialized in such a way. And the, the monuments are uh, crafted in, a, in an orthodox way, uh, where he is represented wearing a halo and uh, carrying, holding an orthodox cross and things like this. But definitely Moscow was, uh, was a favorite city of his. 
Yeah, and I think especially I'm not a I'm not a third Rome kind of a person, but I think it also has a, has this connection with kind of a, a form of Byzantinism. Not saying that Russia was Byzantine, but that in its religion and in some aspects of its culture, it also represents this kind of living tradition of um, imperial Byzantinish culture, so to speak. And I think that's kind of that's very amazing to to know about moscow and that it represents that uh, especially knowing that the icons the iconographic tradition that he wants to safeguard and i'm not kind of i'm not denigrating russian iconographic traditions and whatnot but um like the kind of return in a sense to the traditional forms of iconography uh was really great to great to hear uh that he tried to do that and i and it's kind of, i i believe it shows that saint nicholas you know he wasn't uh just merely religious but he was really in tune with the faith like he was yeah. he was in he he was very well aware of it um he wasn't just merely an orthodox christian because he was born into it and he said well um i'm russian i must be orthodox but he genuinely knew the faith and i think he genuinely knew god and lived that faith properly that's what's really amazing about him and to read about these imperial saints is that you'll realize the reason why we love those imperial saints isn't because they ruled well particularly which they did but it's mm -hmm. because of that how they manifested the faith their humility and their understanding of the christian faith as something much more than just some this this you know cultural armor that you wear it's not that it's much more than that that's like saint nicholas is really illustrating that if, if once i've learned more about his life that i can really see that me personally well, it, it's, it's a, a well-known fact that nicholas began and ended every day of his reign in prayer and i think that speaks volumes for the man yeah, most definitely, especially with his family too, um, yeah. which is something we've kind of forgotten in the West. This familial aspect uh, kind of unfortunately has gone, uh, but I think that's a discussion for another day. Um, St. Nicholas notoriously states, this is another question I have in mind, St. Nicholas notoriously states, all around me there is treachery, cowardice, and deceit. Why did he say that? I, I think we've kind of touched upon that because of the kind of slanders and lies and uh, gossips going around. But was there more to it? Was there something more to that? He recorded that famous sentence or famous quote in his diary after following his abdication. <clears throat> and there was so much truth to it because by that point, everyone around him had pretty much abandoned him with the exception of his immediate family. He was um, abandoned by his ministers because it was some of them, them uh, who uh, requested that his abdication in the beginning. All but two of his generals turned their back on him. And even members of his own family, his uncles, his cousins, um, did not support him in the end. They all turned their back on him. And what's even more disturbing is that Russia was still at war uh, in 1917 when the Tsar abdicated. But Russia's allies, Britain, France, uh, the United States, all turned their back on Nicholas. He fought with uh, a true heart, a true Christian heart, to uphold his Russia standing in the, uh, the alliance against uh, Germany. And in the end, no one came to his aid. And uh, it, is, it is nothing short of a tragedy, uh, heartbreaking that this man who devoted uh, so much to his uh, country uh, was just left, pretty much left to die 
in the most horrific uh, way imaginable. And as and uh, as a, as a Turk myself, I I'm you know I don't remember much of my high school years, but one aspect of this war that I do remember is that it was kind of shocking because uh, we had a massive Turkey had a massive disaster while trying to march to Russia. Thousands of people died without even seeing a single Russian soldier. They they just died because of because they froze uh, because they made the famous mistake of marching against Russian winter and so on and so forth, but. You, you know, it still remained up. And I think this kind of explains explains it because not only on a national level was Russia left alone, which I think can open up discussions such as, you know, why was Russia alone? You know, is there something more to it? Is it was it just a coincidence or is there something about it with these nations where they, you know, said, you know, yeah, let's leave them alone and let's see what happens to them. Um, mm -hmm. I think especially from what I've heard, Lenin was in America before he was in Russia. I think that's kind of an important detail to keep in mind. And um, either Lenin or Stalin, I don't remember which, but uh, yeah, like Turkey faced a lot of devastations and they still, you know, didn't get invaded by Russia because Russia had massive problems on their own. And then seeing this kind of, in, even in his life, it seems like, you know, not only was Russia betrayed by everyone else, it got, it seems like it was betrayed by itself. And... Oh, yes, yes, you, that, you make a very valid point. Uh, even the Russian people, in the end, turned their back on the Tsar. Absolutely. Yes, and um, one of the things that, you know, reading the Old Testament that I... I constantly considered in my mind that really allowed me to have a very healthy view of orthodox nations and whatnot is that when you see this kind of debauchery in in god's nation right nation that nations that follow god uh, you know moses explicitly says i think in deuteronomy that you know if you stop listening to god if you don't act in his ways if you separate yourself from him then god is going to chastise you Right, Saint, I think St. Nikolai Vilimorovich also says the same thing, kind of implies that a lot of the Orthodox nations in the Balkans were invaded by the Turks because um, they kind of just lost the faith and they were sent to chastise them so that they can return back to the faith. And I think this is something that happened to Russia, which is very unfortunate, but um, I think we are at a phase in Russia right now where we are seeing, you know, what's this chastisement going to result in? A renewal of Orthodox Christianity or is it you know, going to be something else. I think that's kind of weird to see about it. And it connects with St. Seraphim of Saros, I believe, letter to St. Nicholas, where he basically says, you know, whoever you are, you're going to be reading this, you're going to be the last emperor of Russia, <laughs> something akin to that. I'm just letting you know that, you know, be prepared. Um, and it's kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of crazy as well, because, um, St. Nicholas was he got killed because of sins of Russia because of the sins of Russia in a sense he kind of bore that burden in his family and that speaks I think incredible volumes about him not just as a Christian but as a as a leader I mean uh, you don't see especially today like presidents you see them for four years then they leave Whereas St. Nicholas, I mean, Russia is, he is Russia. You know, he embodies that and he died for that. That's something we can't really say for a lot of a lot of leaders, especially. I think that's really amazing about St. Nicholas. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add or should I move on to the next question? Um, no, there's one thing. Uh, you had raised a point a few minutes back about um, uh, researching. And uh, I wanted to add that uh, part of the problem with the historians uh, and writers today is that then when they write about St. Nicholas, they tend to focus more on his failures um, and the tragedies that affected his life, such as Bloody Sunday and the Kodinka tragedy, the uh, Russo-Japanese War, uh, and very, very seldom. Uh, tap into all the many, many accomplishments that he had made during his his 22-plus year reign. And I think that that is part of the frustration 
for those of us who are adherents to uh, St. Nicholas in that uh, he is seldom um, acknowledged for the many, many positive changes that he implemented in Russia. By the outbreak of the, the First World War, Russia was, Russia's economy was booming and it was leading the world in the um, uh, crop production, food production, uh, mining, oil production, things like this. And these things are virtually uh, overlooked by uh, historians today. Uh, they Again, they just tend to focus on, oh, Nicholas was a bloody czar, he, uh, he was a, a terrible ruler. Um, I mean, I, I had one woman uh, send me a message one day and she claimed that uh, uh, Nicholas II chased her mother down uh, the street with an ax. I mean, this is the kind of nonsense that circulates to this day. And where does it come from? It just, it just boggles the mind. So if I, if I said then that woman chased me with an ax, will that be legitimate too? Should we like take that seriously as well? Or like, should I say that woman told me I'm going to make up a story about St. Nicholas. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm just letting you know. And I said like, she told me about that. Then people will have to believe that. That's why it's kind of strange that people just take such information, like just on face value and not just asking themselves, you know, Maybe this person giving this information is just stupid or he has or she has some illness. <laughs> like, sometimes <laughs> that's the case. I mean, that generally is the case. Um, and, and about the economy, uh, one of the things that's really interesting and is overlooked is that, you know, especially in an orthodox state, you had feast days, and those feast days will serve as holy days. That's where the word holiday comes from, holy days. Yeah. And in those holy days, holy feast days, you will not work. You will have, first of all, the holidays just made a lot more sense. They weren't just made up all like... Um, okay, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to lose my chance. So I'm not going to get into uh, the holiday I was thinking of, but just made up government and secular hol holidays. That's just you know, just completely made up. Whereas you have Christian holidays that really do have precedence in yeah. the scripture and tradition, right? The, the nativity of Christ, it has its precedence in the scripture itself and throughout tradition. You know, it's really a holy day we celebrate. Pascha okay. is a, you know, it just goes without saying. Yeah. And so many other, other days that I can just list. Um, well, it's interesting because it was Nicholas II who issued a decree which prohibited factory workers and other workers from working on Sundays and public holidays. And uh, that, that in itself is one small example of what a progressive czar he was. Yeah, and um, it gets the question, is especially today, um, we work so much that we get like two weeks of holiday and we think we are kings when, you know, even peasants, even the serfs in Russia, they yeah. could enjoy a lot. Like they had a lot more free time at their hands uh, than today's men. And I think that speaks volumes, especially, you know, they still had a massive population in Russia, uh, but they still enjoyed a lot of holidays. This doesn't mean that, oh, that, you know, all countries had their problems. But I think being able to enjoy more free time for myself is something I will really love to have that I cannot enjoy, but that I would enjoy in an Orthodox Christian nation like the Tsarist mm -hmm. Russia. Um, and this connects to the question that I have, is that how did St. Nicholas see himself in relation to the Orthodox Church? I think you commented on this, that he felt like, you know, he saw himself as someone that was anointed by God. Um, can you expand more on that, that kind of aspect? Well, as we know, uh, Nicholas believed that he was anointed by God. He was the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, and uh, he was, uh, as I said previously, he was responsible for 
the construction and uh, uh, restoration of hundreds, if not thousands of churches across the Russian empire. He developed um, parish schools, uh, which were very, very important for uh, children's education, particularly in the rural areas. And um, he, he and I believe that he instilled uh, a true Orthodox Christian. Uh, he, he was an exemplary example of what a true Orthodox Christian was. And I think that he, uh, he set an example to his, uh, his subjects. Um, he, he would read from the Bible to his uh, wife and children every night. And um, even when he was traveling, he, tra he carried a, a, a mobile iconostasis with him. And so in order that they could uh, uh, erect a uh, chapel, no matter where they were. Yeah, and I think that really reminds me of, uh, of actually St. Justinian in a lot of ways, uh, kind of including even the slander. I think St. Justinian is kind of the... He also kind of represented this uh, leader of the Orthodox world and his time, uh, which was at ma massive turmoil. I mean, you had imperial issues. You had a lot of different countries trying to attack you. Uh, you had personal, you know, problems. You know, maybe you could die tomorrow and you don't even know what the cause is. And then you had severe theological problems. And that's kind of, kind of what I in a way specialize that I, I kind of specialize in that aspect of history uh, personally. One of the things I learned is that he, you know, uh, he wrote theological treatises, St. Justinian. So he was also, like St. Nicholas, very in tune with his faith. And there's there's a lot of parallels over here. I think St. Justinian kind of represents, you know, St. Nicholas, except he didn't have as many problems as St. Nicholas had. So he could construct this massive empire this ma and help develop the Orthodox faith in this very good manner that produced a lot of saints. I mean, I think me, I personally think that it's because of Saint Justinian that we had, for example, saints like John of Damascus, Saint Maximus, and likewise, it is because of Saint Nicholas. I think um, that we are going to see a lot of really important and good Russian saints, and I think one of them might be Father Daniel Sisoev, uh, a great example of Russian Orthodoxy, uh, and. Uh, I think I don't really have much else to add in mind. Um, I think this is just a little less than an hour so far, which is definitely very nice. I, I really enjoyed this this interview. Thank you for taking this time. And uh, for the viewers out there, which I will be putting it those links in the description below, uh, where can they find you? Where can they find your work? You know, where can they buy, you know, buy your books and whatnot, your published journals? Uh, can you well, give a quick uh, rundown of that? If your viewers want honest, uh, well-researched uh, articles on uh, St. Nicholas II, uh, they can visit my blog. It's called Nicholas II, Emperor, Tsar, Saint. And it's at uh, tsarnicholas.org. And there they'll find more than 400 articles thousands of photographs and uh, many, many videos, which will present Nicholas in a very different perspective uh, than the, the popular hell negative uh, one that we are so uh, used to. And as I said at the beginning, uh, as an independent researcher, I have dedicated my life now to clearing the name of Russia's much slandered czar. And uh, I hope that uh, our Lord uh, gives me many more years that I can continue my work, uh, that I can return to Russia uh, once this pandemic has passed and visit all of the uh, holy sites which are uh, associated with the, uh, the Tsar Martyr and his family. May, may God grant us, uh, may God grant you all, that, all those blessings, definitely. Um, and uh i think i think that's 
sometimes my brain just kind of slows down and I'm just thinking, you know, I was going to say something, but I forgot. <laughs> but uh, de mo definitely, I really enjoy this talk. And I think if we have questions from the viewers, you know, maybe they might want us to focus on one aspect of the history. Uh, maybe we can do this, do this some other time as well. I'm definitely open for it. I would be honored to, to do it again. I've really enjoyed uh, chatting with you this evening. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if I may close this uh, uh, discussion, I would like to say, uh, Holy Tsar Martyr Nicholas II, please pray for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, may yeah. he pray for us indeed. And thank you for coming. Uh, and for all of you who are watching, thank you for watching this. Uh, share this to everyone who might be interested in this topic. And I will see all of you in the next video. Thank you for watching. May God be with you all.